In this lecture, we consider the Drake equation. The Drake equation seeks to answer the profound question about our existence in the universe, as sentient beings aware of the size of the universe and our place in it. Are we alone? So far, we've discussed many of the ingredients of astrobiology, the components that go together into this profound question. We've discussed the stars that are suitable for hosting planets, and realize that planets exist around all stars, probably, as a result of the natural process of star formation. We've realized that most of the habitable real estate and most of the planets in the universe probably orbit dim, cool stars, smaller in mass than the sun, and that they live for very long times. So it's entirely possible for life to have had a head start on the Earth and life to persist far longer than the sun will live. We think life on Earth will be extinguished when the sun dies. We know planets form around other stars, and we also know the ingredients for life are universal, found not just in our galaxy, but in all other galaxies. We know in a little detail how to establish what a habitable zone is. We know that it's not as simple as the Goldilocks zone, a distance from a sun-like star where water can be liquid on the surface of a planet, because water can easily be liquid under the cap of rock and ice on a planet or a moon far from a star. This is the cryogenic biosphere. We've also discussed the history of our planet, which suggests that the evolution of the ingredients for life into complex molecules like RNA and DNA and the first cells was a natural process that didn't take that long, and that life on Earth has been around for perhaps four billion years. But how do we put all these pieces together to make any kind of a realistic estimate for whether or not there are other civilizations in our galaxy? The young researcher, Frank Drake, was working at the National Radio Astronomy Observatory, and they held a small meeting on the issue of life in the universe. This postdoc, Frank Drake, went to the blackboard, and he wrote, pretty much from his head, an equation that identified the factors that would be central in evaluating the probability of extraterrestrial intelligent civilizations capable of radio communication in the Milky Way galaxies. And it has a form of a product of a number of factors. On the left-hand side is n, essentially the number of pen pals we have in the galaxy at any given time. The product of factors includes one that's purely astronomical, it's the rate at which stars like the Sun are forming with their attendant planets per year. It then includes the fraction of those stars that have planets. It then includes the number of planets per solar system that are Earth-like. It's then multiplied by the fraction of those Earth-like planets on which life actually evolves, which is then multiplied by the fraction of those planets on which the life eventually becomes intelligent which is then multiplied by the fraction of those planets on which the life eventually develops the means to communicate through space. All of these fractions get multiplied by a number which is the lifetime of that civilization in the communicable phase. Now, it's a truism in mathematics that if you multiply a set of factors together and each of them has an uncertainty, the uncertainty of the product is limited by the largest uncertainty of any of the factors. And we'll see how this plays into the Drake equation soon. But this lets make some assumptions and pick some typical numbers. Starting at the left-hand side of the factors, we can assume the Milky Way produces about 10 long-lived stars per year. In other words, we're ruling out massive stars that have short lives and picking sun-like stars or less massive. That's a well-measured astronomical number, fairly robust, fairly accurate. Let's assume that 80% of those stars have planets. So the fraction of planets is 0.8. This is now becoming a pre pretty well-determined number from the Kepler spacecraft. In round numbers, every sun-like star has at least one planet. So this number is unlikely to change, and that first fraction is high. Let's further assume that half of these systems will have planets orbiting in the habitable zone, at least one. And so n sub e becomes a half. This is also a number that's becoming better determined as our bag of exoplanets exceeds 4,000. And soon we'll know this number pretty well. Then it becomes uncertain. 
If we assume that life will always develop in the habitable zone and that life will always evolve intelligence, then 100% of habitable planets will evolve intelligent life and the next two factors are one. Recognize this is a very strong assumption. It doesn't have to be the case because microbial biology obviously stayed simple and was not even multicellular for a couple of billion years on the Earth. If that process of going from single cell to multi cell had taken five or six times longer, the sun would have died before we even got multicellular life form, when life was no larger than a pinhead, and so intelligent life would not be possible. So we have to be aware that these fractions could be much lower than one. Then, just to pick a number, we make a 50 50 assumption on the chance that intelligent life will eventually develop interstellar communication capability. Again, we have no logical basis for making this estimate. And finally, we'll assume that civilizations retain their capabilities for interstellar communication for a thousand years. Since n is a product of a series of factors that includes l, n is proportional to l. In other words, the number of pen pals in the galaxy scales linearly with the lifetime, or average lifetime, of those civilizations. What can we say about l? Well, not much. We can say that at present, in terms of our technology, L is about 100. But we might look at our recent history and realize that in the depths of the Cold War, when L was only 50, we nearly extinguished ourselves to mutual nuclear destruction with the Soviet Union. There's also the possibility of bioterror or pathogens that wipe out humans. And so it's not clear that L is a large number because humans have come close to the edge of cataclysm before, and they might do so again. Can we really persist for a millennium in our current technological state? Some people might be doubtful. With all these numbers added together, multiplied together, we have the product. It's about 1,000 or 2,000. And that would be the estimate, using these numbers, for the number of civilizations currently capable of sending and receiving interstellar communications via electromagnetic radiation. We've just picked some arbitrary numbers, and a few thousand is a big number. That's a lot of pen pals. But also recognize the galaxy is a big place. It's 100,000 light years from one side to the other. And so a signal, if those, even if all those civilizations existed, would take 100,000 years to travel from one side to the other. It turns out that if n is a thousand or a few thousand, the average lifetime of a